Yep. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning if you happen to be in America, and good evening if you happen to be further east. It's my pleasure to um, this afternoon to represent the president, Richard Stock, who sadly is having some technical problems. He may have had a power cut like we had uh, last night from the storms. Um, luckily down here, uh, we're back on, uh, maybe up in um, the Liverpool region, he is having problems. So he's asked me to uh, just take over the chair of this meeting for the time being. He may well appear and let us hope that he will. Yes, he does send his apologies to everybody. Anyway, we have a hundred and um, some odd uh, folk uh, online today and from uh, numerous countries throughout the world. And I wish you all from the Royal a very, very warm welcome. This afternoon, Gerald Mariner, uh, very well known philatelist um, who has been uh, working uh, for, for uh, public philately in, in Britain for a very long time, particularly in the ABPS and other societies and organizations, um, is going to give us a show about the um, occupation of the Channel Islands during the Second World War. This calls to memory a visit I made to the island of Guernsey some well, very many years ago now, because I was still, a, a, I think, in the in, in the Boy Scouts. And we went to that extraordinary um, underground hospital, um, which I must say, at that age, had a very strong influence on my experience. And um, in latter years, it reminded me very much of nuclear bunkers that have since been built and gladly have never had to be used. Anyway, uh, the Channel Islands, in this part of the world, we're never quite sure whether they're part of us or part of France or part of the EU or part of some other organization, or whether they'll just sink gently into the Atlantic along with everybody else. But uh, without further ado, Gerald, I would like you please to uh, uh, give us your uh, presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, fellows, members, and guests. As Peter has said, the title of my presentation this afternoon is the German occupation of the Channel Islands and really the disruption to the mail service. The Channel Islands were occupied by German forces on the 1st of July, 1940. And from that date onwards, there was no direct postal communication between England and the islands until their liberation in May, 1945. My first slide shows a cover sent on the 27th of June, 1940, from a, an evacuee who had just arrived in England, uh, writing to her grandmother who was still in Guernsey. Unfortunately, this cover missed the final sailing of mailboats to the islands and therefore was returned to sender, as you can note from the cachet. I was fortunate in purchasing this item because there was a letter enclosed and you can actually see uh, some of the comments there. We had a terrible time coming over. We we're over one day in the channel on the boat, two to 300 babies and mothers. It was awful. Uh, sad times indeed. I show here another cover. Uh, one of the other islands within the Channel Islands is the island of Alderney. This was very close to the French mainland. And because of its close proximity there, it was decided to evacuate all the islanders prior to the occupation, and therefore the post office was closed. This is a cover from Whitfield King, those postage stamp dealers in Ipswich, dated again the 29th of June, and again it missed the final sailing, and we see on the front of the cover as the service suspended cachet. Certain people in the United Kingdom, certainly business people, didn't realize the difficulties of sending mail from England to Jersey. And here we've got a sort of letter card sent in August 1941. 
uh, from the Legal and General Assurance Society to a lady in St. Helier. It was confirming the fa her fire insurance arrangements for her furniture in storage. It got uh, the postmark, but it was uh, returned to sender by the censor. Uh, commercial mail could not be sent out to German occupied territories without a specific, specific license. By September 1940, people in England were getting concerned that they couldn't write to their relatives in Jersey. So it was believed that they could uh, send mail direct to the islands via Thomas Cook, who were acting as forwarding agents in Lisbon. The actual address was PO Box 506. What they would do, they would send the actual message or letter plus a addressed envelope, which the people at Thomas Cook will put a Portuguese stamp on and post it on its way. As you can see, this is the actual cover sent from Thomas Cook, the Portuguese stamp addressed to Jersey. Uh, it was routed via uh, Portugal and censored in Cologne. We've got the censor tape on the left hand side with the code letter C for Cologne, strangely C, not K. However, it then moved on to Paris, but unfortunately, the postal system between Paris and the islands, or the German postal system between Paris and the islands, was not functioning at that time. So uh, it got an inadmissible cachet. It's also got a return to sender cachet, but they couldn't return it to sender. This cover was held in the post office in Paris until the end of the war, and then we get it detained in France during German occupation cachet applied. It could then have been forwarded on to its destination in Jersey, uh, which would be five years later. By December 1940, the International Red Cross had established a message service so people in England could communicate with their loved ones in the Channel Islands. However, messages could only be 25 words or less, and these were sent on special forms, and one of these is illustrated on this particular slide. These messages were routed via Lisbon, Geneva, you can see the Geneva cachet with the Red Cross in the centre, in Paris, and could take up to six months to reach its destination. However, later on, after the uh, liberation of Paris, that route became impossible, and loads of uh, Red Cross message forms got held up in Lisbon, uh, and eventually these were transcribed in ten into ten words messages in documents, and these were forwarded by the Red Cross relief ship, the Vega, direct to the Channel Islands, arriving in early 1945. Once they reached the Channel Islands, the messages were retyped on plain paper and then forwarded to the addressee. And you can see an example of the, one of these on this particular slide. And the next voyage, uh, further message, summary messages uh, were supplied, but this time, the Red Cross Message Bureau in Guernsey had a special form printed entitled Summary of Civilian Message in Suspense at Lisbon, Portugal, destined for the Channel Islands. Now, what was the situation going the other way from the Channel Islands to England? Well, on the 1st of July, 1940, the islanders in Guernsey actually believed that the German authorities would allow them to write one final letter on the 1st of July, back to their friends or relatives in England, uh, but that wasn't the case. This is an unusual one, it's addressed to the regimental paymaster of the Royal Artillery in Leicester. Uh, it was obviously opened by the Guernsey Post Office and resealed with the white tape, as you can see. This had to be obviously returned to sender because there was no such postal service. Again, by September 1940, Islanders were getting concerned about not being able to contact relatives in England and they believed that they could send mail to England via a neutral country, such as Portugal or the United States. I show an example of such a cover here, addressed to the British Vice Consul in Lisbon, but at the bottom you can see it's endorsed, cannot be forwarded to destination, return to sender. And none of them got through. In 
in Jersey, the bailiff of Jersey's inquiry and news service was set up in St. Helia to handle the mass of Red Cross message forms which were arriving on the island. By January 1941, 2000 Red Cross inquiry messages from England had arrived. And this, show, this slide shows a reply written on the reverse of a message form from England, dated the 13th of January. This was in the first batch to be sent back from uh, the islands back to England. Notice the very scarce uh, bailiff on Jersey cachet on the back. Uh, the islanders didn't like this at all for obvious reasons, but being in German, it was only in use for two days and examples of this are quite scarce. Uh, the octagonal pass sensor mark at the bottom of this particular message form showed that it did actually reach England. He then eventually, uh, in April 1941, special Red Cross message forms were made available to the Channel Island residents. These are provided by the German Red Cross and were printed in German and French. This form was sent uh, from Guernsey in July 1941, and it was guest addressed to a Guernsey evacuee in England. Her address was unknown, but that, so they, all they could do was address it to the Channel Island Refugees Committee, which was in London, and hopefully they got the address of where all the refugees were, and it would be forwarded on to them from there. And again, this took about six months to get there. And again, problems uh, as we mentioned England to Channel Islands from Jersey to England again problems uh, after liberation very few liberation of Paris very few message forms could get through in August September October uh, but the during this period the Germans were sending their own correspondence letters back to the armies uh, loved ones relations etc etc on special flights to Berlin. These were known as fortress flights. Uh, and on the sixth fortress flight, uh, it was agreed that Red Cross messages could be sent uh, back to England. And I show one carried on such a flight. Not many of these are recorded. Uh, you can see a faint geprüft uh, cachet at the top of the form. This was applied in Jersey. Uh, there's no, most of the messages obviously went via Switzerland, via the International Red Cross in Geneva, but there is no Geneva mark on this particular item. Uh, so I'm not quite sure of its route back to England, but obviously it did get back to England or when it in fact got back to England. Was it after the end of the war, etc.? We now come to a section looking at the mail service between the islands. Now, between, Sark, uh, between Guernsey and Sark, or vice versa, there was no censoring of mail. It just went from one island to the other. Uh, these are interesting postal stationery cards. They're sent by the, Dame Sib the famous Dame Sybil Hathaway. I should mention that Sark had its own feudal, feudal government at this time, which was called the Chief Please. And the late person in charge of it was Dame Sybil Hathaway. Uh, a very formidable character. I show here two postal stationery cards, one a King George V one and the other a King George VI one. Uh, these were uprated to the correct tuppence rate because the postage rate, postcard rate, was increased in May 1940 to tuppence. You can see the card addressed on the right hand side to Boots the Chemist. Well, Sybil Hathaway got a dog that was not feeling very well at this time, and she had written this message to obtain tablets for her little dog. Another island, we've already mentioned that Alderney was totally evacuated prior to the occupation, uh, and it, the German soldiers and forced labor were turning it into a fortress. Uh, but the Germans were very concerned that there wasn't enough vegetables for the armies to eat over there. So a working party of young men was sent from Guernsey to Alderney to grow vegetables for the German troops in 1942. This was a cover sent by a lady called Ruth to her boyfriend, Roy Toomey. Uh, and you can see that he sort of 
wasn't a philatelist, obviously, the way he'd ripped the envelope open uh, and the halfpenny stamp is actually missing with a tutney halfpenny rate. On the back, we see the letters S-W-A-L-K sealed with a loving kiss. It ended happily for, for Roy and Ruth because when he got back, you know, I think it was in 1944, the two of them actually got married. Inter-island mail between Jersey and Guernsey and vice versa. Well, this again was, this cover was sent on the 1st of July, 1940 to Guernsey, but again, no postal system had been sorted out at that time. The Jersey post office held on to it to the 13th of July in the hope that it could be forwarded, but it couldn't. So the cover was endorsed, no postal service uh, returned to sender. Eventually, obviously the system between the two main islands, Guernsey and Jersey, was sorted out. And I show here a nice commercial cover from January 1941. First of all, it shows a, an example of the use of the centenary, Tutney centenary stamp bisected. Uh, the locals were allowed to bisect Tutney stamps because of a shortage of penny stamps in, the, in Guernsey at that time. This was following a suggestion from the German authorities and Islanders were allowed to start bisecting stamps on the 27th of December and this continued until the first local stamp was issued in February 1941. The address is nice as well, it's addressed to the fellow commandante, the German sort of civil command in Jersey. Generally the mail just went straight from Guernsey to Jersey or vice versa, but there are on odd occasions the Germans decided they wanted to censor it and it was sent to Paris. So it was routed Guernsey to Paris, then Paris back to Jersey. It was censored in Paris. You can see both of these envelopes were opened and resealed with German censor tape, uh, code letter X, X being the code letter for the Paris office. Uh, not quite sure why these items were, but maybe it's the address on the left-hand cover, Shalom Millbrook. Now, I believe that the Paris office was there for sort of domestic mail and the other, one of the other censor offices was for newspapers and commercial correspondence. Although examples of mail through this Frankfurt censor office are extremely scarce. The one on the left hand side is a newspaper wrapper and the one on the right hand side was from the Westminster Bank in Guernsey uh, with an unusual uh, meter mark. Uh, and this was sent to the manager of the Westminster Bank in Jersey. And you can see the reverse of that cover shows again the censor mark. This is a very unusual cover sent in May 1943 from Guernsey to uh, Jersey. And again, this was routed via Paris where it was censored. You can see on the back by my red arrow there, a little bit of red, and that is the censor mark for the Paris office. Uh, obviously it contained uh, some interesting correspondence, should I say, that the Paris authorities refused to move it forwards and it was just held in the Paris, uh, in Paris, in the post office there, until Paris was liberated. Upon liberation, obviously the Channel Islands were still occupied in 44, so it was forwarded back to England. And you can see the English censor tape examiner 2325 on the left hand side uh, and initially he resealed it didn't write the contents so you can just about see it faintly condemned uh, hand stamp was applied in red it remained in uh, london until after the war until after the islands were liberated and then eventually uh, it was sent on you can see the london postmark on the back march 1946 it was sent on to its destination in Jersey. So this would have taken over three years in transit. Again, generally after the liberation of Paris, uh, mail, even if it was censored, just went straight from Guernsey to Jersey, but it was generally censored if they wanted to censor mail, and they certainly didn't censor very much that I've seen over the years. They just opened it, resealed it with brown tape and applied a censor hand stamp which you can see on this item sent from Guernsey to Jersey. 
and a similar item is shown here, sent from Jersey to Guernsey, and again showing the German sensor mark in Jersey, and you can see a little bit of the brown sort of uh, sensor tape. Now we look at the next section I show is mail between the islands and neutral territories or territories occupied by the Germans. Here we've got a cover sent in August 1940 uh, from Jersey addressed to Ireland, but again there was no direct service, certainly not through the uh, Jersey post office, it would eventually be through the uh, German Feld post office, which we'll come on to later but this is endorsed no service and was returned to sender. Now going the other way, this is from Dr. Hanna in Jersey, addressed to his brother, Mr. Justice Hanna in the High Court of Justice in Dublin. Now in November 1940, they hadn't a clue how to send the mail across to Ireland at all. They, but they'd obviously heard of the Red Cross message system. So they thought, well, we'll send this envelope and hopefully interlinks with the Red Cross message somehow. We'll inscribe it at the top through the German Red Cross and hope it gets there. Well, it did get out of the islands and ended up in Granville in France. But again, you can see in blue crayon endorsed return jersey. So it never got through. Here's an interesting cover. This was sent from Ireland to Guernsey in December 1940. This actually did get through. You can see on the left hand side there is a pink sensor tape. This is the standard Irish sensor tape. Uh, and it was then routed from there to England, where again it was censored examiner 4249. It then went uh, via Lisbon, Spain, and ended up in Frankfurt, where it was censored. You can see on the left hand side the German sensor uh, hand stamp for Frankfurt, code letter E. It would then have gone on from Frankfurt through Paris to the islands. Now, unfortunately, either the gentleman had been evacuated prior to the occupation or wasn't at that address. So it had to be returned to sender. But unfortunately, at that time, you still couldn't send mail back from Guernsey to Ireland. And you see at the, on the top of the front of the cover, the cache, no service. Mail simply that got through, here's a cover from Ireland to Guernsey, sent in 1941, routed via Munich. Uh, and again, we get the Irish and English sensor tapes. And you can see on the right hand side, which is on the reverse of the cover, the German sensor tape code letter D, which is the code letter for the Munich office. This was sent from Lady Shaw in Dublin to her daughter, Mrs. Anne de Poutron in Guernsey. Another item from the same correspondence. The family have still got a lot of this correspondence and uh, they refused to sell it, unfortunately. Uh, this um, was routed via Bordeaux uh, and it went straight from Bordeaux straight up to Paris and then Paris to Guernsey. How do we know it's Bordeaux? Because on the lower side, on the reverse side of the cover, we can see German sensor tape, code letter Y, and Y is the uh, code letter for Bordeaux. Uh, another way of getting messages from Ireland to Guernsey was by sending a message to the Irish legation in Paris and they would then retype the message and send it direct to Guernsey uh, in a special envelope in in, uh, inscribed error and they just put a French stamp on it. Unfortunately it was underpaid, it should be I think one franc fifty. Uh, it was sent on the, posted out on the 10th of January 1941, and it still took over six weeks to arrive in Guernsey. You can see the arrival date stamp on the bottom left, 21st of February 1941. Eventually, uh, a Red Cross message system was introduced in Ireland, uh, and here we've got typical Irish Red Cross message form printed on green paper. Then I look at other countries, uh, an unusual one here from Helsinki, Finland, uh, sent in 1941, addressed to Guernsey. Uh, it was routed via Lyon in France. And then you can see Baal, it was then forwarded to Baal 
forwarded on to Frankfurt and then Frankfurt eventually to the islands. Here we see two examples of Channel Island Holland mail. The first one is from Amsterdam to Guernsey uh, and the second one is actually uh, Jersey to Holland. Uh, both of them were censored in Cologne and again we see examples of the Cologne censor mark there, code, uh, code C, so routed via Cologne to get to Amsterdam. Two covers here, one from Norway to Guernsey and the other Jersey to Norway. Uh, these are routed via Berlin and again you can see the sensor tape on the left hand cover, code letter B for Berlin. The right hand one shows that what, you, how you could send mail from the islands. You couldn't use British stamps or locally printed stamps. There was one German field post office on Guernsey and another on Jersey and you had to use German stamps for that service. 25 pfennigs was the correct letter rate and all they got was a standard Feld post date stamp with the actual date which didn't signify the origin of the actual cover. An unusual one here from liberated Belgium to Jersey sent in March 1945. Uh, well obviously Jersey was still occupied and the only way it could get anywhere it was eventually it ended up in London and it received a registered uh, return letter section oval date stamp and also an unusual cachet return to England without a reason for non-delivery. This was eventually returned to Belgium and you can see the arrival date stamp at the bottom of this particular item. I then look at some finally, fine final section is looking at uh, one or two sort of unusual covers uh, from unusual people. We have here a guy called Bertrand, Mottram, Bertrand Morton who was uh, in the expeditionary force in France at the start of the war and unfortunately he became a prisoner of war in Cherbourg and in August 1940 there was no uh, POW systems or no POW cards or, or anything like that. He was determined however to send a letter to his wife which this is the cover and he hadn't got any stamps obviously being in the prison so he thought well I'll put the letters PG prisonnier de guerre in the top right hand corner and let's hope it gets through free of charge. So uh, he duly did. Somehow it, just, it was uh, escaped out of the prison and into the postal network. It got the Sherberg machine cancelled and then they looked at the address and they thought, oh, we can't possibly send that out. So they put a cache on it in a missable return to sender. But obviously they also couldn't return it to sender uh, because it shouldn't have gone out of the prison camp to start with. So it, there were lots of still island fishermen sort of fishing in the neighbourhood of northern France and it got to the hands of one of the fishermen and was smuggled back into the islands. Now for those that have been to the Channel Islands, like myself, I love the islands, I think they're wonderful, but unfortunately this particular lady uh, was fed up, didn't like the quiet life, uh, in the islands at all and told her parents I'm going to live and work in London which she duly did and she met a met a guy and eventually married him the only problem was he was of German nationality so at the start of the war they were both interned in the Isle of Man in the internment camp and this is a letter from her to her mother uh, in 1943 it was censored obviously in England, we got the opening by examiner 5202. Uh, it then went from London to Lisbon. From Lisbon you can see the Madrid hexagonal date stamp. From Madrid it went through Bordeaux, we've already mentioned the Bordeaux uh, censor mark before, you can certainly see the code had a Y on it. And it then went past unopened through Paris, you've got AX mark of Paris, and then it eventually arrived in Guernsey. Then come to the Eugene Lelievre story. Uh, this was one of, of, I believe, of only two letters he sent out. He was a policeman 
and uh, this is one of two recorded letters he sent out from this prison, one to his wife and the other to his parents. He was one of a group of policemen imprisoned for stealing food from a German food store on the island. They had the aim of redistributing the food to those in need on the island. The Germans didn't take kindly to it at all and he was sent to prison. He was sentenced to eight months in prison uh, and this is his initial letter. Obviously no postmarks or anything on it. Uh, he was then eventually transferred to prison, Cannes prison in France and then on to Dijon prison. He was due to be released on the 25th of November 1942 but he was transferred within the prison complex to the Nazi secret police, the SD, in January 43. So then he wrote this letter on old bit of scrap paper uh, on the 2nd of March 1943 requesting his release, stating that he'd been had completed 56 days extra imprisonment. And you can see on the right hand side of this uh, slide the actual address, sort of Pulitzer uh, and Dijon. Uh, he was actually released uh, and he and his wife ended up after a couple of weeks or so in the islands, they were both sent to internee camps. Uh, his wife was sent to Compiègne in France and he was sent to Kreuzberg. Very unfair to split them, but there we are. And this is a internee postcard from his wife Suzanne in Compiègne to him in Kreuzberg. But one month later after this was sent, uh, uh, his wife joined him in Kreuzberg. I'm not sure whether they stayed in that camp for the rest of the occupation or another camp, I believe it was Bliberac, uh, but they certainly stayed in internee camps until the end of the war. Then we have the story of a young teacher, Vivian Milne. Uh, she, she was arrested in 1943 for operating an illicit radio and passing on the news to other islanders. She was initially sent to the local prison, whose address you can actually see on the left hand cover for Gloucester Street. So if anybody sees any covers addressed to for Gloucester Street, uh, it's not to a person, uh, it's to a prison uh, and I would be interested in purchasing from them. Anyway, Postage wasn't required on uh, this item, so the stamps weren't cancelled. But on the top left of the cover, you can see a German censor mark. She didn't stay long in this prison. She was transferred uh, to a uh, prison in, the United, in uh, France. She'd spent four months in the local prison and then spent a load more months, eight months in the prison in Jersey, in uh, France. The right hand cover shows a cover from her to her friend Miss Webb in Jersey. And then after a year, she was released, went back to Guernsey. And then after the war, she went to Oxford University, gained her degree and ended up as a professor of English at Kent University and died in the late 1990s. And the final story I have is of the famous honeymooners. Ron and Eileen Harris got married in London in June 1940, and he decided that they would go to Guernsey for their honeymoon. And unfortunately, whilst there, they missed the final sailing of the last sort of boat back from the islands to England. So they were a bit stuck there. And the Germans uh, obviously occupied the islands and effectively they had a five-year honeymoon, although I say honeymoon in inverted commas. Uh, these are their identity cards which they had to have prepared when they were in the islands and he got a job as a farmer in the islands. But following a uh, in, 19, in November 1942, islanders of British nationality were sent to internee camps in Germany and these were sent to Biberac but obviously Ron was sent to the uh, mail barracks, they were sent to different barracks, he was sent to the mail barracks and she was sent uh, to the female barracks and here we've got a birthday card from Ron to his wife in May 1944 
saying many happy returns with pleasant memories of past happiness and many more years of enjoyment to come. Uh, that was the 44 one, and he wrote another one after the, after the camp was liberated in May 1945. By then he'd only got a little sheet of paper and a little plain envelope. Uh, and it just says, many happy returns of the day. This birthday has brought peace and may the next bring prosperity and a greater degree of comfort. That was written after the liberation. So really it's a fine fitting end to my story of the German occupation of the Channel Islands. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Gerald. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Back to you, Peter. Mark, that was, sorry, um, uh, Gerald, that was, that was really uh, fascinating. Um, some quite extraordinary pieces of philatelic uh, um, interest there. Um, and certainly uh, a number of things that I had no idea about previously. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the, um, the process that we occupy, that we carry on these days is to take questions at this stage. That's correct. Um, so I'd be delighted um, for anybody who, who wants to ask a question to uh, please put it in the chat, uh, which you'll see at the bottom of the um, screen. Um, otherwise, uh, I, I've no doubt Mark will, will be um, fielding the um, Googlies coming in from uh, lots of uh, interested parties. And um, yes. we'll take questions now then for Gerald, please. Yes, thank you, Peter. Yeah, um, just to be clear, everybody, if you want to ask a question, the chat box is at the bottom of the screen. When you put your mouse over the, uh, the Zoom window, the chat control appears at the bottom. You click on that and you can then type your, your question into the chat box. And people have started to do that already. Uh, Gerald, the first question comes from Albert Jackson, who asks, what was the process for sending fr uh, the Red Cross forms and, uh, and what was the fee? That, that's his question. Uh, initially, there was a fee of one shilling, which was reduced to sixpence. There was one Red Cross message uh, bureau in Guernsey and one in Jersey. I mentioned the one in Jersey during my talk. Uh, initially, as I said, all they could do until the beginning of 1941 was just send replies. They would hand these in to the Red Cross office and they would forward, they would write it on the actual form and they would be sent in great bundles uh, on, the, on their way to Paris from the islands, etc, etc. In England, each town had got a Red Cross message bureau and they would go to their Red Cross bureau instead of their post office and either write the message themselves or the message would be typed from sort of a rough copy by the Red Cross message staff. And again, it would be forwarded by London, then collated into bundles and do the routes, which I've just said. Okay, yeah, thank you, Gerald. Um, Harold Krieg has a question. He says, could the Germans send mail with the local post office to Germany using local stamps? No. The actual, I haven't included any of the troop mail in my presentation, but the troops were allowed to send the mail back to their relatives or friends in Germany or Austria uh, via the Feldpost office. They would get the Feldpost date stamp as I showed on one of the covers earlier on, but they would send it post free. Uh, it could only go out of the islands via the German Feldpost office. A lot of Germans sent philatelic covers to themselves or to friends within the islands but the only way to send mail out for the Germans was via the German field post office. And for, as I said, troops had it free. Uh, others had to pay 25 pennies. Okay, thank you. Um, at the moment, I think those are the only two questions that we've had. If anyone's got any more questions, please do put them in the box. Now's the time to do it. Um, ah, yes, um, question for you. Uh, Gerald from Thomas Lindekens. He asks, how many years have you been collecting this subject? 
is it difficult for you to add something more? <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Uh, that's one of the reasons I started collecting Belgian Congo. Uh, very difficult to find anymore. I've been collecting this material since 1920, so it's my 50th year of collecting. Uh, occasionally one or two nice items come on the market, but it is very difficult to find anything unusual now. Right. And um, Clive Laws mentions the Ireland to Channel Islands correspondence. He, he says that's fascinating. Um, he says, do you, ha do you have a family link with Ireland? No, I don't. Uh, it's just the way when you're collecting or going through dealer's stocks, you see certain items, you think, well, I've not seen anything from Ireland. Uh, and I just got fascinated with it. And over the years, anything that's come up in major auctions or whatever to do with Ireland, I've acquired. And uh, I've got other items to do with the Irish Channel Island link in my collection, which I didn't obviously show today. Uh, but I just find it a fascinating uh, area of collecting. It's not easy to find, uh, but no, I haven't got any relatives in Ireland. No. Okay. Well, um, I would say, Peter, that that was the final question that I've seen. Um, so I yes, think... I, ju I just have one question myself, if I may. Of course, just... of course. Yeah. Thank now, you, Peter. <laughs> Um, I, I noticed that um, you had mail that was going, um, in some instances via Paris, in other instances via Frankfurt, and in other instances via Berlin. Um, and I wondered, was there any particular rhyme or reason for that, or whether it was purely a matter of, you know, whatever happened to be going in that direction took the mail? I can't really answer that. Good question, Peter. Uh... I don't think there was any, I haven't found any particular rhyme or reason. Maybe I need to study this a little bit in more detail as to why generally the primary sensor station I would have thought for Channel Islands would be Paris. Uh, but again, as to why it went to Cologne or Frankfurt, I'm not sure. So I really can't answer that one at the moment. More research needed. Well, there we are. Uh, even even some of the greatest collections still require a bit more research. So that's uh, that's very encouraging for everybody, I'm sure. Um, but thank you, Gerald. That was absolutely fantastic. Now, it's my pleasure to, um, uh, I don't think I have to introduce um, uh, Mark Bailey. Uh, he's been on um, on and off all afternoon. Um, and you <laughs> will all know his face very well indeed. We, we understand he has got ears somewhere, but... Um, <laughs> that they're usually covered by these black uh, targets. Uh, anyway, Mark is, is kindly volunteered to do the vote of thanks this afternoon and Mark, it's over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, yeah, now the only reason I wear these, uh, just to clarify that point is because it prevents the sound going off all around my house, given that my wife is currently working from home, as I think we can appreciate. Um, so, Gerald, what, what, um, what a wonderful display. I mean, we've, we've heard already um, some uh, very co uh, positive comments from, from uh, Peter about it. From my perspective, I think it's been wonderful the way that you've been able to show us items not only relating to the uh, difficulties between uh, get, getting mail between the islands and Great Britain, given that all the uh, uh, that a lot of the people who lived on uh, Jersey and Guernsey um, were evacuated to the UK um, uh, just prior to and in the early early uh, days of that uh, occupation, just leading up to the occupation. Indeed, ships took took a lot of people to to the UK, and uh, we've heard about the difficulties of of the of the communication on the mail service there, when, given that that was suspended. But also, of course, looking at the bigger picture in terms of the mail going to other countries, uh, the obvious ones, obviously, uh, nearby, like France, uh, but also further afield. I mean, um, this was something that I hadn't considered, even though I'm, I'm a member of the Channel Island Specialist Society, was the, the impact that this would have in terms of the difficulty of moving mail through um, the countries that were occupied by the Germans as part of the, uh, of the war in Europe. And uh, I mean, the, the examples there to um, Norway and Finland and so on, I mean, they're, they're really great examples 
of, of the problems with that. So thank you very much for showing us with those. The, the, um, the Red Cross uh, service, the Red Cross message service that was provided by the Red Cross in Geneva, that I was very familiar with. But again, the, it really brought home to us today, I think, how tricky that was and how long it took for people to get their messages through uh, to their loved ones, um, up, upwards of six months uh, in, in some cases. So this, this whole theme that you've covered today with the disruption uh, really, I think, has been very in interesting and very educational for us. So I thank you very much on behalf of everybody. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Here, here. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm sure we all, um, if we were able to, would uh, raise a chair, raise a glass and give Mark you can a, raise a, a glass. Very, very, <laughs> uh, He's um, come a quick. Very, yeah. uh, a warm thank you for that, uh, Gerald. That I, you put a lot of work into that. I know exactly what it's like um, because you can go through your pages and you think, oh, well, I'll just take a picture of the page. And of course, it doesn't come out anything like that. Uh, when it goes into a PowerPoint. So you have to scan everything separately yes. and put them all in different places and fiddle around for hours and hours. Uh, but, but thank you very much indeed. I thought you did that beautifully and we're all most grateful. Thank you very much indeed for your kind comments, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen. Um, Peter. I, sorry? Peter. Yes, Mark. Um, as you know, uh, Richard was unable to join us today, but he did ask me to... Um, for us, as it were, to present electronically, of course, um, a certificate of appreciation to Gerald, which will then be followed up in the mail. So may, may I show that at this point? Please, yes, I'm, I, I'm sorry, that slipped my memory. That's okay, no, no problem. Um, I'll do that in a moment. I'll make sure that I've got it available, yeah. Here we go. It's, it's probably going via Lisbon and the Thomas Cook. <laughs> Thomas Cook, unfortunately, has gone bust. So anyway, here it is, yes. You, you can all see that, yeah? We okay. can. Yes. Uh, all right, Gerald, so... Thank um, you very much indeed, Mark. Yeah. I understand that uh, the office will be obviously mailing you the uh, the actual printed copy, of course, with, with, with the signature on and so on. But you appreciate that uh, for now we've, we've got this electronically. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Well... Um, Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, Gerald, again. Um, before we go and have our electronic cups of tea, um, I suggest that um, uh, I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, first of all, the news from Abchurch Lane, um, which um, comes through from time to time. Um, unfortunately, since the second lockdown, um, I haven't been there myself, but it, it is still um, open to uh, members of staff who are boldly going in and doing work on our behalf, and we thank them most warmly for doing that. Um, members of the expert committee are also going in from time to time, and we thank them for their uh, loyalty. Um, but also, I'm very glad to say that finally, the roof has been fixed. There was an issue with um, uh, the, the, the quality of the plywood on the uh, border of the, of the roof, and uh, further uh, scaffolding had to be put up, um, the plywood had to be changed, and it's all been done. Um, and the scaffolding has gone away. And generally speaking, I think we are pretty well free of all contractors, uh, although wow. just at the moment there, there is a certain amount of final snagging going on. But, but we, 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 we're absolutely at the end of that amazing, twisted and, and tortuous road. And I know that um, Chris King, once again, is to be congratulated on bringing the thing to a close. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. And um, we are so, so looking forward to getting lots and lots of you back there just as soon as we possibly can. Absolutely. Everybody's waiting. The staff are waiting. The books are waiting. And, and, and the frames need filling up. So we look forward to that immensely. Now, the next part of the programme for the Royal Philatelic Society London is in a fortnight's time which is the 26th of November. And um, Simon Martin Redman has very kindly um, uh, put together a, a, another um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, it is called um, 
something in the order of pirates of, of Penzance or something like that. Um, I, 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 I've forgotten exactly what it's called, but it's basically about Sarawak. Sarawak being the um, small country on the north coast of the island of Borneo, which was occupied um, or taken, uh, given to, I think, possibly uh, even, um, to Roger Brook uh, way back in the 1860s, and uh, which now is part of Malaysia. It has the most fascinating philatelic history, and Simon will be um, giving us a demonstration of that uh, in, in, in a fortnight's time. So please don't forget. It is at a different time, however. Uh, I think it's at 2 p.m., am I right, Mark? That's correct, yes. yes. The reason why it's at 2 p.m. is so that members of the Sarawak Specialist Society, many of whom uh, live in Kuching, which is the capital of that place, and in that area will be able to see it rather than staying up all night. Um, so yes. it's been brought back an hour to 2 p.m. Don't forget, fortnight's time. Look forward to seeing you. Mm. And meanwhile, I think we can open up the... Um, unless anybody has anything further they wish to say yes peter um, i do you do right over to you mark then and then after that we'll open up to um general discussion and chit chat indeed thank you Th thank you peter um chris and beata are able to explain about the german sensor stations so i think we should hear from them for a moment oh yes definitely yes so uh chris we'd like to unmute and over to you well, it being censorship, it's complicated. But each of the offices, and there were quite a number of offices, um, was responsible for a particular area geographically. So if a letter came from ERA into occupied German territory, it actually went to a particular censorship station. So for example, Berlin dealt with Denmark uh, from February 1940. Uh, Cologne, uh, dealt with mail between Germany and Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg after the 30th of September 1940. Munich dealt with Albania and various other countries. And if you're interested, there's a book by Horst Landsmann uh, wow. called, in German, The Censorship of the Civil Post in Germany in the Second World War, uh, which is a big yellow book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it explains uh, office by office and at the different times because different offices dealt with different countries at different times. They move them um, from place to place. So you need to look at the book and it'll take you a bit of time. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. And just lastly on the building, it's wonderful to hear good news about the building. Um, and Peter's absolutely right. We are dealing with the snagging and the clues in the words they're snags and they may take a little bit longer than Peter said but they are very much near the end. <laughs> uh, thanks very much and thank you Peter. Yes that, thank you very much uh, Chris. Um, what I would also uh, I mean today we mentioned that uh, for the Sarawak meeting in a fortnight's time we, we will be inviting uh, members of the Sarawak Specialist Society, I think you said, Peter. Um, today, we were very glad to extend uh, the invitation to attend this talk by Gerald to the members of the Channel Island Specialist Society. So it was, uh, we, we, we're delighted that some of them were able to join us. And I hope that they found Gerald's talk as interesting as I did. So thank you every, every, very much. So I think you're right, Peter. I think we should... Um, close the formal part of this meeting now and say that we'll now have the informal part of the meeting. Uh, so we'll open it up for, for, as you say, for, for social exchange. So I will stop recording at this point uh, so that we can do that. <laughs>